This is Professor David Edgerton, who's going to be talking to us now all about uh, university funding structures, the history of the university, and how that shapes silos and discipline. Professor Edgerton is one of the leading historians of, the, of industrial uh, issues, of the history of science and technology, and of modern British history. Um, and I'm very, very delighted to have you here, David. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward very much to your talk. And just before you get started, I'd like to ask everybody who's watching, please do take advantage of the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to get your questions in afterwards. David, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, James. Well, my, th my theme today is that we have big problems uh, in thinking about uh, innovation. Where does it come from, what it is, what effects it has? And I'm going to talk about this theme in, in, in two parts, Reid. Really. The first is about the myth of the Ivory Tower University. And the second is, um, I'm making the point essentially, that we don't know what is being invented, where, why, and by whom. My overall point is that one of the key things that we all agree on is that innovation is really important. But it's not really well understood at all. Worse, we believe it is well understood. The tragic reality is that we are inundated in cliches about innovation. Cliches that damage our ability to innovate, indeed. One particular problem is that today we've come to believe that inventions do and should come from universities. The idea is that universities elsewhere, notably in the United States, have become great invention factories and British universities should become like them also. The problem, it's alleged in the UK, is that for far too long, universities have been stuck in their own ivory tower. But there are two problems with this view. Universities are not great inventive places, and not even in the USA. There are some exceptional cases, to be sure, but most inventions happen elsewhere, today and in the past. Uh, the Second is that British universities have not in fact been ivory towers. It's a standard argument of tough guy declinists who dominate commentary on British universities and they've been making the argument for decades and decades. It just happens to be wrong. Let me take the example of the most uh, ivory towerish university of all, uh, at least allegedly, and that is in the UK, Oxford. We all know the image, an intellectually dead place teaching itself dead languages. But obviously, Oxford was also a worldly place with its eyes, its ambitions fixed on the outside world. What better example indeed than the Oxford Union itself? The point hardly needs labouring. But Oxford wasn't short of engaged dons either, from let us say Gilbert Murray uh, and his involvement with the League of Nations, or GDH Cole and labour politics, or all, all Souls and Imperialism, or indeed All Souls and Appeasement, to speak only of the interwar years. But of course the ivory tower image in this declinist mythology isn't concerned with empire or appeasement or labor politics, it's concerned with industry. Uh, surely Oxford in the early 20th century had nothing to do with uh, industry. Well, you certainly have to believe that if you read most of the stories of Oxford, but it's simply not true. Uh, take the case of J.S. Haldane, a physiologist intimately involved with mining or take uh, chemistry. Oxford had the largest chemistry school in the country. Uh, it supplied uh, imperial chemical industries, one of the great chemical enterprises of the, of the world with large numbers of, of staff. Oxford professors were consultants, not only to ICI, but to many other chemical companies as well. Oxford's um, uh, chemical labs were endowed by industrialists, much more so in the 1920s and 30s and than in the 1950s or 1960s. 
the Dyson Perrins Laboratory, uh, the Nuffield funded um, uh, laboratories um, uh, as well. More famously, uh, this school of pathology was the place where um, uh, 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 penicillin is turned into the, uh, the drug uh, we know. And did after the war, cephalosporin uh, comes, out of, uh, comes out of Oxford. Indeed, that is a very nice example because it's one of the very, very few university patents to have ever made any, uh, any money. Um, let me take a Cambridge example from the 1930s, which looks like a spin out, uh, the jet engine. A company called Power Jets was formed by a Cambridge student uh, to develop the jet engine. That student was called Frank Whittle, and he was supported with city money and indeed uh, um, an encouragement of the Royal Air Force. Interestingly enough, the jet story is not told in this uh, way. Uh, it could be uh, quite straightforwardly, although it'd be somewhat misleading. Why misleading? Well, because Frank Whittle had already invented the jet by the time he got to Cambridge. He was sent to Cambridge by the RAF to develop the idea, and most importantly of all, to study the high level engineering he needed to do it. And yes, Cambridge did have a huge engineering department. And one of its specialisms going way back to the First World War was aeronautical uh, engineering. So British universities, um, even before World War II, uh, even Oxford and Cambridge are intimately connected to uh, industry. However, universities, indeed Oxford and Cambridge, were overwhelmingly teaching institutions. What mattered were their graduates. And of course, lots and lots of them went on to become uh, uh, inventors and to work in inventive institutions. Men, for example, like Michael Perrin, uh, uh, Oxford chemist, who was key in the development of polythene in the laboratories of Imperial Chemical Industry in the 1930s. He indeed went on to work in the British nuclear program. He was one of these many Oxford chemists who worked for ICI. Amongst the others was a man called Wallace Akers, who was in fact uh, to direct the entire British atomic bomb project during the Second World War. I'll come back to, to, to that project in a, in, a, in a minute. As industrial researchers of the interwar years uh, noted, university labs are very different from industrial labs. The latter were interdisciplinary. Uh, they were sometimes called need convergent laboratories as opposed to divergent uh, university laboratories. A very good example would be uh, laboratories in the photographic industry, where lots of uh, scientific specialists from different uh, specialisms converged on the problem of photography. People concerned with optics, people concerned with colloids, people concerned with silver halides, and so on and so forth. Uh, university laboratories, obviously, not like this. But what were university laboratories like? Well, first of all, they were teaching laboratories primarily. Uh, we keep forgetting that universities are fundamentally teaching institutions. They're also, of course, um, uh, research institutions. But interestingly, in uh, uh, the late 19th century and the early 20th century, they, they covered only a tiny part of um, their discipline in their research activity. Laboratories, university laboratories, often uh, develop the work of what historians have called research schools. And the focus of those research schools could be really rather narrow. I mean, a famous case is University College London in the, in the Edwardian years, which focused on the chemistry of the noble gases. Um, but there are, there are many, many other examples of that, of that focus on, on very particular um, uh, elements of a discipline. Now, there were laboratories, there were uh, inventive, intelligent uh, people working uh, in them, but did Dons invent? The answer is a little bit, but not very much. Uh, it wasn't what they were supposed to be uh, doing. 
What are examples of inventive dons? Well, one of my favorites is uh, the German chemist, Walter Nernst, a very important um, uh, 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 physical chemist, I suppose we'd, we'd call him uh, today. His uh, great invention was something called the Nernst lamp. It was a, a solid uh, incandescent lamp that you had to light with a match, believe it or not, an electric light that you had to light with, with, a, with, with a match. The point is you, you had to get the temperature up before this ceramic material would conduct uh, electricity and therefore uh, light up a, uh, a room. A brilliant, brilliant uh, in, in invention uh, sold for squillions of marks and uh, indeed dollars uh, uh, to electrical companies uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, alas, um, it didn't find much uh, much use. The the, the tungsten uh, um, uh, uh, incandescent uh, bulb in the in, in the uh, in the in the evacuated uh, uh, bulb uh, became the norm. Though it did find a very very niche uh, use, and that is in the very first fax machines, uh, which were, believe it or not, around uh, in the First World um, World War. So uh, uh, Nernst did very well out of uh, uh, his, uh, his invention, though um, the world uh, 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 didn't. The, 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 uh, the purchasers of, uh, um, of, of, of lamps were paying uh, over, over the odds to keep, uh, keep Walter, Walter Nernst in, uh, in luxury. But there, there are uh, examples of great success, and I suppose uh, one of the most uh, remarkable is that of uh, cases that of uh, Fritz Haber, um, who, who uh, in, in, in invents the, the famous Haber process for the fixation of, uh, of, of nitrogen. Uh, of course, he's working very closely with the German uh, chemical industry, but um, he, he develops a process that it's gonna be at the heart of world agriculture uh, for uh, uh, certainly the second half of the 20th century and indeed in the 21st um, uh, century. So academics are not there to invent. They're there to teach primarily, to provide training. Now, part of that training at the beginning of the, the 20th century was um, for people that wanted to do degrees in the sciences, uh, chemistry, physics, and so on. But very often, uh, pure science departments, as they were uh, called, were involved in the teaching of students in other careers, above all medics. To a considerable degree, all across the United Kingdom, the sciences were service departments for medical schools. And indeed, it's important to remember that British universities were uh, certainly in the case of the civic universities, medical schools with science departments and arts departments tacked on. Uh, overall, some one third of British students, and it's important to remember that Oxford and Cambridge were, were much, um, much more important part of the system in the interwar years than they were, were to become. A third of, of British students were medical students. So the university um, was about uh, training uh, and about teaching. Let me turn to now to how we think about uh, invention and innovation. The sad truth, and I say this as a historian of science and technology, is that we don't have a decent history of invention or innovation. Uh, it would be interesting to have one. And, and here are some essentials, I think, of a proper history. The history of invention is necessarily a history of failure. It's most inventions have failed. Uh, patents are a very poor measure of uh, invention. Um, they are also, indeed, an archive of failure. Not of all inventive failures, uh, but a good proportion of them. The history of innovation is less of a history of failure than the, the history of invention, but still overwhelmingly a history of failure. Now, we have accounts of invention, but they are typically stories of success. 
stories of inventions and innovations and the diffusion of these innovations uh, in cases where there is success. But actually, we don't even have a decent account of all the successes, strangely enough. We have only accounts of those cases which are deemed to be important. Uh, academic cases uh, are probably overrepresented. Now, the atomic bomb, which I'll come back to again, would be one. Penicillin, partly an Oxford invention, would be uh, another. Indeed, an invention that overshadows the industrial uh, sulfonamides, which were the first uh, um, antibiotics and were hugely important right through the Second uh, world, um, world War. So um, we don't have a history of invention or uh, innovation. So it's rather difficult to uh, um, answer the question, where did inventions come from? What were they and what did they uh, achieve? Well, we have actually a very particular stories that focus on inventive institutions at the time in which they are themselves novel. So if we were to check in the, um, in the books, what was being invented around the 1890s and the beginning of the 20th century, we'd be told a story about um, the chemical industry, chemical laboratories, the electrical industry and electrical laboratories. The second industrial revolution, a science-based industry, uh, the, uh, a period when the academy and industry become connected uh, in particular in so-called industrial research laboratories. Does it follow from this emphasis that invention is concentrated in ele electricity and uh, chemicals? No, it doesn't. A huge, a huge range of inventions is left out of the story. My favorite example concerns tobacco. Uh, there's a very uh, important invention of this period, the cigarette making machine, uh, a, a machine that, uh, that, that has transformed uh, the lives of uh, billions of people in the 20th century by producing cheap cigarettes. Interestingly, cheap cigarettes were not of much interest in the United States where uh, much of the world's tobacco came from. Americans before 1914, especially, uh, preferred cigars. So enormous inventive effort was put into a failed attempt to come up with a cigar making machine. But I defy you to find a history of invention which mentions the, uh, the cigar making machine uh, alongside uh, the great laboratories of uh, BASF or, or Bayer. So, uh, where was invention uh, happening? Clearly not just in these in industrial research uh, laboratories. The cigarette machine didn't come out of industrial research laboratory, nor did motor cars, nor did aviation. Uh, the Wright brothers were not employees of some great enterprise with a laboratory. Likewise, the steam turbine didn't come out of the electrical laboratories or anything like it. Around 1900, as far as we can tell, uh, the great mass of invention was still being carried out by individuals and the great mass certainly outside the two iconic inventive industries. So um, let's take the story uh, forward to the 19. Uh, 30s and 1940s. And here the, the great invention is, of course, the atomic bomb. And that does indeed have uh, an academic source, not really a British one in the 30s, but a German one. But when it came to bomb projects, and by the way, the British bomb project of 1940-41 was the largest in the world, 
these were not run by academics. Uh, they were run by engineers uh, of, with military experience and great corporations. In the United Kingdom, the most important contractor for the British bomb project was Imperial Chemical Industries. As I just uh, mentioned a second ago, it was run, the whole project was also run from the government end by uh, an ICI uh, uh, chemist. Also important was Metropolitan Vickers, a great electrical uh, company. And if we look to the United States, certainly all the books will talk about Los Alamos and will pretend that Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Manhattan Project. He wasn't. He was the director of that one uh, laboratory. If you're going to take a, a proper view of what it took to invent the atomic bomb, we can't ignore the role of the DuPont Corporation. We can't ignore the role of chemists and chemical engineers, nor indeed can we ignore the role of the photographic company, Eastman Kodak, and indeed many, many uh, others. And remember from this period, the jet engine. Uh, uh, developed not just by Frank Whittle coming out of Cambridge, but aircraft firms uh, in uh, Germany and in the UK, and indeed government establishments uh, as well. Indeed, it could be argued that the great industrial laboratories of the chemical and uh, electrical industries only really get going as important inventors in the 1940s and 1950s. This is the great era of the new plastics, polythene being just, just one. It's the great era of electronics um, and uh, the, the, the hugely important role of Bell Labs uh, in the development of, 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 of modern electronics is, is, is rightly widely uh, acknowledged. But even in this period, individual inventors matter. One of the, the best known British ones is a, a man called Percy Shaw, uh, who was a small scale road uh, uh, building uh, contractor from Yorkshire. He invented the cat's eyes, a very important part of, of our lives uh, to this uh, day. And indeed inventiveness during and after the war uh, was to be found right across industry. Uh, and many inventions in what are taken to be old fashioned industries had very important effects. Think of the bulbous bow in shipping. Think indeed of the shipping container. Now, what happens if we move forward to the 1980s? Well, uh, I come back to this point that we don't really uh, know, uh, but we know some features of what happened. And one uh, uh, was the closing down of, the of many of the great, uh, certainly not all, the industrial corporate laboratories. Indeed, I briefly worked in one such corporate uh, laboratory in 1977. The ICI corporate laboratory was in fact uh, uh, called in Runcorn, Cheshire. I was working on a substance called vermiculite, a clay mineral. ICI had developed uh, drying equipment to make a non-tobacco smoking mixture, which was obviously a catastrophic uh, failure but they were looking to use the techniques they developed to dry other stuff. And someone came up with a bright idea of, of drying vermiculite uh, um, uh, uh, suspensions to make sheets and foam, a fireproof insulating material. A brilliant idea, but it went nowhere. Indeed, that little story reminds me of the observation I once heard on a radio program that most scientists working in the pharmaceutical industry spend their entire careers working on drugs which never came to market. Now, there were um, big spenders on research and development uh, in the 1990s, despite the closure of some of these corporate uh, laboratories. What were they? Well, the top spenders actually were motor car makers. They weren't, um, uh, there were also great electrical and electronic uh, and chemical companies, but the very, very top were car companies like the Ford Motor uh, 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 Company, illustrating yet again 
that invention is happening everywhere. But the story that we were told from the 80s onwards was a very different one. The focus was on Silicon Valley, on the university spin out. A huge rhetorical emphasis on that. The university as the, the new inventor of all the most important things that were coming into uh, the world. Now, it's very striking that most universities are funded by, including the, the, the most important inventive ones, are funded from their endowments, from government research grants and tuition, not from their inventions, which I think is worth noting. So where do inventions come from today? And we supposedly live in a great age of invention. Well, I have to tell you that I don't really know. I can also tell you that our best indicators, research and development spending and patent counts, tell us very little uh, indeed. The difficulty is we speak and write as if we do know. Not only about where inventions come from, and what the important ones are and what their effects are, but how they shape world history. We speak about first industrial revolutions, second industrial revolutions, third industrial revolutions, and now, um, as never before, uh, about fourth industrial revolutions. Well, the one industrial revolution, I should say, the one fourth industrial revolution that we are supposedly going through, which is driven by AI and robotics. Uh, now, this is a an appallingly narrow, misleading, old-fashioned, uh, damaging way of thinking uh, about technological change. But it is, there is no question, the dominant one. Uh, notions of the Fourth Industrial Revolution sell books, help organize conferences, get you research money. But it is by any serious academic standard, tosh but valuable tosh. So we have very limited understanding of invention. We have very limited understanding of something we call technology. I think this is an intellectual uh, uh, disaster. Uh, we shouldn't be thinking in cliches about something as important as the material constitution of our world and how it's changed through human action, through invention and innovation and the take up of inventions and innovations. But that is where, where we are, speaking in cliches about some of the most important foundations of the modern world. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you so much for that. Um, from, from the atomic bomb and the valuable tosh of the fourth industrial revolution to faxes and cigar making machines. I'll stop talking in cliches and pass over to Rob, who I know will not be doing that. My colleague Rob will now be conducting this Q&A portion. But Professor, thank you so much for such an interesting talk about this. My pleasure. Thanks, James. And, and, yeah, and, and thanks again, Professor. Um, for, for those of you watching, you can submit questions through the Q&A. A bunch of you have done so already. but keep them coming and I'm going to do my best to try and squeeze them all in for the next half hour. Mm. Um, I, I guess just sort of as a starter and, and stepping back from from the paradigm that we're clearly stuck in at the moment, which is an imagination space where we, we seem to think that a lot of brilliant stuff comes out of universities and nowhere else. I suppose I'm curious and wanting to start with the question of, of why do you think we've ended up with this narrative? That the political economy question mm. or needs to be thought about at what point did we start telling ourselves that all of the brilliant advances we were seeing in the world came from the university centers rather than from whether these big corporate labs or the individual geniuses you highlighted so let me throw you that one first yes well um uh, i mean uh, academics i suppose have had the time and the space uh, um to make the claim that that uh, they've they've been great in, in inventors uh, that's part of it but since the 1980s there's been a great 
uh, pressure on universities to justify uh, their use of public funds. And uh, it suited universities very well to uh, promote the idea that they were great invention factories or should, 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 should become them. Um, uh, uh, I mean, these arguments are fundamentally arguments to get public money. Uh, it's, it's wonderfully ironic. The, arg the argument is that that um, uh, that universities are, are hugely inventive and will produce massive uh, massive profits. Um, but but uh, 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 instead of being an argument for letting universities just get get on with it, it becomes an argument for for massive subsidies. And indeed, the amount of money that's gone in from from governments across the world uh, to university research has gone up and up. Um, and indeed, the proportion of government money going to universities as opposed to industry for research has gone, has gone up and up. There's an interesting line there that, that it kind of chimes with what you hear from some of these American um, thinkers. And I know, you know Peter Thiel's obviously come out with his book of Zero to One, but there's been a broader criticism of, of mm -hmm. trust economics in the US based on the idea yeah. that it played a big part in shutting down those corporate labs and setting up the university as the alternative to innovation that previously would have happened inside monopolies. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if I see that parallel emerging from what you're describing, and I'd be curious for your thoughts on, on whether it's an accurate one. Yes, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a, there's, a, there's a connection between the two things, but, but certainly corporations were running down their central uh, laboratories at the same time that, uh, that universities are being encouraged to, um, to develop uh, um, uh, more kind of industrially focused uh, research. And certainly in the case of the pharmaceuticals, that, um, that research, um, that pharmaceutical companies are relying more on research done by, by startups. But the pharmaceutical sector has been an enormous one. It's been growing at every level. So, so I, I'm, I'm not sure the argument would apply in that particular case. So there's almost the danger that the, the critics I was citing are, are, are committing the same sin <laughs> as the people they're criticizing and being too confident. Yes, exactly, exactly. I guess, I guess sort of stepping sideways from that and into you know, one of the central pieces, at least of the UK structure, which is the so-called Haldane principle, you know, the idea that it should be the researchers in the field who are, who are determining you know, what gets funding rather than political patrons. Um, I'd be really curious for, for your thoughts you know, on that principle, on, on, on whether it, it actually exists as a principle or whether this is another um, fictional invention and, and maybe also whether you know, insofar as it does exist, uh, it's a recipe for, for conformity or, or, or actually just making sure that new things can get can get funded. Yes, the, the Haldane principle is a is a very um, uh, interesting one and it gives one an insight into uh, uh, the the nature of the the, the discussion around uh, university uh, research. It is a mythical principle uh, in that no no such principle has ever existed. Uh, but people have, in starting in the 1960s, invented um, a, a, a very particular principle, um, uh, which was the one you described, that, that, that ac academics controlled uh, research. Now that, um, that um, uh, uh, represents a very, very serious misunderstanding of how government has actually funded research because most government funded research, and right from the, the beginning, has been directed at particular um, uh, aims by government departments. So uh, the principle simply didn't apply. If it, if it existed, it didn't apply to the great bulk of, of, uh, of, 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 of research. So it's false on that uh, account. Um, it doesn't even apply to that bit of research that the more sophisticated commentators think it did apply to, i.e. the research councils. And the idea that, that the research councils were run by academics and chose um, what research should be done is wrong, because these research councils involved all sorts of people who weren't academics. The um, uh, um, most famous case was Lord Balfour, who was the chair of the Medical Research Council in the 1920s, and indeed reported to himself as a rep responsible minister uh, uh, as well. Uh, so, so it's never been the case that the British government ha has, has let academics um, determine the research policy of the state. And so I guess, I mean, the two obvious 
follow-ons from that, you know, one of them is the question, and maybe you just toss your hands in the air. You know, why? Why do we believe this principle? If, or do we believe that this principle exists? If actually it doesn't exist and has never existed. Um, mm. And then, secondly, accepting that it doesn't exist. Do you think it should exist? <laughs> it, it is as an ideal it is itself based on on misconceptions about invention and innovation. Yes, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, why does it exist? It exists for 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 crass political reasons. Um, uh, the the um, the notion of the Haldane principle was invented in the 1960s to criticize the Labour government's research policy, which was, which was seen as introducing a greater element of government control over research. So you invent the principle uh, so, that it, so you can show it's been violated. And the scientific community did exactly the same in 1972 around the Rothschild report, which supposedly abolished the Haldane principle. It did nothing of the sort because Lord Rothschild being a clever man recognized that the principle didn't exist in the first place. Um, and then in the, in the 1990s and subsequently, uh, again, there's talk of the whole damn principle as something which is being violated. Uh, and then the government comes back uh, and defines the whole damn principle to show that it's not being violated. Should we have it, um, even if, we, if, if it, uh, if it doesn't uh, exist and has never uh, existed? And no, because the reality is that governments will fund research for lots of different um, purposes and, 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 and should indeed. Um, what we should have is a doctrine of academic freedom, which is a very different matter. Um, people conflate the two, you see. Uh, they're, they're a different matter. Uh, the United Kingdom has had a tradition of academic freedom, but that's been defended not by the mythical Haldane principle, but by, in the past, deeply ingrained notions that universities were autonomous bodies um, and, and that, that academics had a certain autonomy and directive power uh, um, within them. So, yeah, I would, I would most certainly want to defend the principle of of academic, uh, uh, academic freedom. But the idea that academic freedom is being defended by uh, research councils who supposedly um, uh, incorporate the Haldane principle into their, into their practices seems to me an absolute nonsense and, and you know, indeed a danger to, to academic freedom. I'm really keen to loop back to re research councils because there are a couple of questions that have come up on that, but I think there's another very natural question I'd like, I'd like to squeeze in here first. Hmm. It's just, I, I was struck when reading the history of primary scientific advances, um, you know, at, at least up until the 20th century, just how deeply integrated with industry and practical technological innovation they had been. Hmm. You know, far the model of the ivory tower was even when it comes to primary scientific research let alone uh you know, invention things that are actually useful um and i i don't know if, if that's something that has changed you sometimes hear this argument that you know the sciences of the 20th century needed the university in order to still make primary steps forwards do you think that's fair or do you think there's also a bit of a myth going on that these teaching institutions these universities are the source of the primary scientific advances um that, that raise all boats on a rising tide Yes, I, I mean the worlds of, of university research and um, the the the, uh, the economy more 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 broadly are are, are deeply inter interconnected. I mean, one one cannot understand um, the existence of, let us say, atomic physics without understanding the existence of a of of, um, of an electronic industry. One can't understand the development of atomic physics after 1945 without understanding the states were investing massively in atomic bombs and in in um, in, in, in in nuclear in nuclear reactors. Uh, so so yes, the the um, or solid states. I mean, you can't understand the rise of condensed matter physics you know, without understanding that Bell Labs uh, invented the 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 the, the, the transistor. Um, so the connections are 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 intimate. Of course, of course, they they are. Um, and uh, I mean, people argue they became more intimate in the 20th century than they had been in the in the 19th century, but that that may reflect a misunderstanding of the 19th century. So, so this, this then kind of I think brings us around to one of the questions that's been put forward by by one of one of the viewers at the moment. Who says, you know, one of the main ways that we think about the importance of universities today is as a partner to industrial research, as as the place mm -hmm. industrial workforce is trained. Um, and as, as a center of expertise that industry can tap. How much truth is there in that in, in, in your perception? What do you make of that idea? 
Oh, enormous truth. And, and, that, and indeed, that's uh, if you're to ask, you know, what is the, what is the main contribution of the universities to the economy? It is providing uh, skilled and knowledgeable uh, uh, people, um, and indeed to act as a as a as a as a as a, as a, as a credentializing and uh, a selection mechanism as well. But uh, um, uh, but yes, that that is much much more important than than the university role in in, in invention. Um, uh, and and that's the one that I think that ought to therefore be 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 emphasised. Of, of of course, I mean the great managerial hierarchies of, of, of modern corporations have been dominated by university graduates. Of course, that's to say for the last uh, 70, or, 70 or, or eighty years, and the whole startup culture of today is is of course a, a graduate culture. I, I suppose one one of the images of the university that's kind of coming out of of this talk, at least for me, is, is this image of them as a professional academic uh, guild center, like a, a nexus of education and networking and, and going back and, and getting additional study. And I, and I suppose one of the things that is surprising to me about that is when I think about the way that academics are promoted and remunerated, you know, it's very much based around publishing papers. You know, it's very rare to have an academic who's, who's risen to stardom within a university mm -hmm. body off their teaching credentials. And so I'm curious as to whether you think you know, that that way of running universities is a product of a, of a misperception of what universities are useful for, mm. or is there something else going on? Yes, I mean, I, 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 I think that's right. I mean, people are, are promoted on the basis of, uh, of, of teaching. Of, of, of course, of course, they are. But um, but there's no doubt that there's been a, a, a de deliberate uh, incentivizing of, of research uh, through 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 the research. Uh, Excellence framework and 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 all, and all the rest of it. So so yes, there is an expectation that um, that large proportions of academic staff and everybody in, in the elite institutions should be a researcher, and that that would have seemed extremely odd to academics of the nineteen twenties or nineteen thirties. Uh, and I and I think there I think there are negative consequences to overemphasizing research. Um, uh, and it's an interesting question. You know, if, uh, what would be the net net effect to, to human understanding of cutting university research in half? I suppose it depends what what half you cut, of course, and <laughs> one wouldn't necessarily trust uh, <laughs> um, the system to, to choose the right half. But uh, um, well, th th this is where we reassure everyone in the audience that that the half that would be cut would not be the half that they draw their income from, but <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose that that sort of links around to one of the one of the debates that's been going on publicly, and that's linked with uh, um, economist Matsukato, Marine Matsukato, whose entrepreneurial state book sort of traces back the, mm. the role of, of state funding in the PhDs of, of different people who went on to invent large parts of, of the modern um, industrial apparatus. And, and, I, and I think she argues that these inventions couldn't have happened without the late twentieth century structure for funding. Um, and, and, and I suppose I'm, I'm curious um, as, as to how much truth you think there is in that and, and whether you think that that's you know, slightly focusing more on, on the late 20th century experience compared to all the invention that happened before that system got set up. I, I don't want to lead the witness, so I'll, I'll stop. There. Yes, yes. Um, well, uh, I mean, of course, it's correct that, that governments have played an enormous role in, in promoting um, invention and innovation, uh, especially in the second half of the 20th century. And, and the, the British government um, uh, did itself did an, did an awful awful lot uh, so yes the states uh, have been have been Im important but of course they didn't rely on universities as their main agents of, uh, uh, for doing doing r d absolutely not and they had their own laboratories uh, now much run down um, and they funded huge amounts of research in industry uh, itself and of course procured the results of that research whether it was concords or nuclear reactors or or telephone exchanges or high-speed trains. So there was a very particular kind of national innovation uh, complex, uh, which operated within the framework of, a, when it came to, to, to uh, you know, machines of this, this, this kind of very autarkic uh, context. So the story today is radically different. Um, and I think one great mistake that advocates of, of strong uh, national innovation policy make is that they don't understand that we live in an open world where there is competition. Uh, so the, uh, the United Kingdom, you know, could um, do a kind of Dominic Cummings uh, um, DARPA thing on a, on a massive scale, but the chances are that the Americans and the Chinese, and perhaps indeed the EU as well, 
um, would come up with uh, competing uh, technologies and come up with them first and produce them more more cheaply. So, uh, uh, you know, following um, a, 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 a national strategy for innovation doesn't guarantee success. Indeed, the experience, the historical experience of the United Kingdom is that uh, that was tried and and it uh, and it failed in the standard accounting, which is why we're no longer doing it. But there is this residual belief that British universities were places of, of particular genius and inventiveness, uh, and therefore ought to be supported in the hope that they will generate new industries. But we've been living with that um, that story for 40, 50 years. And we you know when I ask people in the research councils, well, give me an example then of stuff which has come out of research council um, uh, funding with, uh, which has been driven by this, uh, this strategy since at least the 1990s, they, um, they start getting very um, agitated. Um, and and, and um, when they come up with examples, they, they, they come up with promises uh, for future inventions that will, that will do this. They're not giving me historical examples of great new enterprises that have, that have uh, transformed, transformed the world. And the next stage actually is then to say, to, to pull an iPhone out of a pocket and say, arm, yeah? Uh, uh, you know, as, 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 as if um, uh, we skeptics are gonna kind of, kind of fall over and put our, put our feet in the air and, and, and give up. Um, I mean, arm didn't come out of a research council project. Um, uh, and we all, we all know that, uh, but it's interesting that uh, that, uh, um, that that people resort to, the, to these kind of these kind of arguments. I mean, it's a serious question. We've pursued this policy. What has it yielded? I, I suppose just sort of touching on that point of research councils. You know, I think that it's a natural point to sort of twist back round to to, to, a, to a different strand of questions that are being put forward. Um, so to, you know, the series that we're taking part in here is, is very much looking at academic silos as well as industrial silos. Um, and these include the, the, the myths that we believe and it mm. also includes the way that funding can reinforce those myths. Yes. So, so I'm curious, you know, when you look at the academic disciplines as have mm. developed on campuses, you know, what role do you think government systems of, of patronage to different university disciplines is defined as disciplines rather than as just people with academic freedom to go off and, and look in any corner of the world that they happen to find interesting. So what mm. do you think that has helped create a, a series of silos in academia? And then mm. and do you think that I'm just being a little bit over the top and dramatic when I, when I frame it that way? I, yes, I, I, this is a very familiar argument, isn't it? That, uh, that uh, university research is stuck in these departmental uh, disciplinary silos. Yeah? Uh, I mean, I've been hearing it since the 1980s. I can't remember when, when the term silos came in, perhaps that's a little bit uh, later, but it is a dreadful cliche, isn't it? Um, and, um, and so the argument then is we have to go interdisciplinary and we've got to have special initiatives and, and the academics are all against it. And blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, we've had interdisciplinary, well, the two things. One is that um, there's a difference between the research that is done in industry, which is interdisciplinary, and, and that, that's done in, 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 in the academy. But even so, in the, in the academy, we've had all sorts of interdisciplinary initiatives, some of them very, very powerful. Uh, let me give you an example from my own institution. Uh, in the 1940s, um, Sir John Randall, is, uh, who, who was one of the key figures in the development of the cavity magnetron uh, physicist, uh, 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 becomes the head of a, a biophysics unit, uh, which is using new physical techniques to study uh, living things. Uh, and, um, and, and this, this institution becomes uh, central, particularly through Rosalind Franklin, for the elucidation of the structure of DNA. Uh, interdisciplinary research, so there it is, you know, at, at the heart of a, of, a, of, a, of a British university in the, in the, 19, in the 1940s. Um, and I think you know one could one could go 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 on and on, but um, but the real point is you know why should university research be interdisciplinary? You know what is the underlying argument? And it's some kind of notion that interdisciplinary research is going to be more productive, in some sense. Where's the evidence for that? Um, and uh, so and it's also intimately tied to this notion that universities should be inventing things. And of course, inventions are interdisciplinary. Therefore, you should have interdisciplinary 
work done in in in, in universities. Um, it's 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 again you know one of one of these ideas that has been around for an awfully long long time uh, is based on on uh, to put it no more strongly than this on a misunderstanding of the real history of of uh, of of universities and is fundamentally a story concocted um, to change things and to, and to get money from 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 government um, partly through claiming that the future is going to be different from the, from the past. So, so I guess then, then just to come back to that, that central model that you see for, for understanding the role of the university, which is this place of, of, of teaching primarily mm. rather than of necessary discovery. You know, one of the other great mm. cliches, and it's a cliche that I also, you know, as someone who signs up to the idea of silos, I mm. also sign up to this other cliche, which is the, the idea of credentialism, um, yeah. and, which is, I think, a, a fairly common criticism of, you know, it used to be the case that you, d you didn't need to have a... a you know, a BA or an MA in order to get a job. And increasingly you're seeing that being taken as a bare minimum when the actual education content of that arguably remains as mm. not useful for becoming a, a productive member of society as, as it ever was. Mm. So curious if you think there's a bit more meat on the bones of that particular, of that particular criticism. I mean, credentialism is a, is a, is a thing, obviously. Um, um, and I think we don't care anything like enough about the content of the knowledge that we're we're passing on, um, I think I think that's that's a, that's a, that's actually an, a, an important issue. But um, but we you know, we do collectively benefit from 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 having um, uh, uh, our, our, our young uh, you know educated to the age of, of twenty one. Uh, so so I, I I'm 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 not, I'm not going to criticise that. I think that's a that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and we shouldn't uh, 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 tie our universities too much to uh, our notions of the of the labour market. I think that would be a, a bad idea uh, as well. And we need to remember that a place like Oxford, um, in in the inter interwar years, was to a very considerable extent turning out teachers. I mean, school teachers. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that's the model we should have for the for, 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 for universities. That that people that come out of them should be able to teach their subject. Uh, uh, in in school, that's a nice modest um, uh, uh, ambition, I think. Do you think it's fair that I mean a lot of the different things we've you've touched on in the in the last hour um, seem to have come down to this quest that universities have been on for the last maybe maybe just since the nineteen eighties, maybe prior to the nineteen eighties, you know, for justifying why they they should receive state funding yes going into a series of instrumentalist ways whether that's you know we're where all of the invention really happens we're where you train people to be really great for the labor force you know the, the yeah. sure we're, we're mainly just teaching things based around this set of disciplines but guess what we're also where whole new ideas get born rather than simply being the teaching institutions they maybe were a hundred or so years ago and, and and so do you think do you think it's a case of what we should do as a study is go out and say well actually let's just go back to having you just as teaching institutions thank you very much and we're going to try and detach you from from these labor market norms mm. or do you think that that teaching model of the university from the 1900s has had to evolve and needs to evolve into these capacities um, as mm. our political economy changes mm. is the older yeah. model for the future or, or, or do we have to make this myth a reality there you go i came up with a i came look, up look, with I'm, not, I'm not i'm not against research universities i'm a researcher um uh, and uh, university research is is, uh, is valuable, um, and I, of course I, I do recognise the, the, the political imperative uh, to, to to say anything that, that that convinces government to to hand over the dosh. Um, my worry is that 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 that, um, that if if we come to believe those arguments ourselves, our, our capacity to teach properly and to research properly are are are, are damaged. Um, so the, the idea would be a world where one could sell universities um, more, more honestly, as it were, uh, to, 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 to government and um, uh, uh, whether that can be done or not, I, 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 I don't know. But certainly I think we, we ought to have a proper discussion as to, as to what, uh, even if we don't let ministers in on it, um, uh, <laughs> or the public, indeed, perhaps, um, uh, on, on what what universities uh, should should be about. Yeah, because there does seem to be there that that kind of two sided question, and, and someone's pointed out in in, in the Q and A just now was the question of uh, you know, do, do you think governments would actually be happy to fund universities if they thought they were just about teaching? And I guess the flip side of that is you know, is there a 
is there an honest pitch for a, for a value add that universities provide or is there almost a degree of um, the university system relies on misleading governments as to how useful yeah. they are um, in order to sustain yeah. I mean, I, I, I hope I'm not going to be quoted on this, but I, I, I think, <laughs> I think um, the research community uh, generally, uh, uh, you know, has 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 relied on on, on very poor arguments for, uh, for 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 government funding of, uh, of of research. I think there are there are good arguments out there, um, and I think those need to, those need to be developed. Uh, and, I, and I do think the university research is 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 very is, is very uh, very valuable. I mean, one of the the arguments I would I would make is that we, as um, community and deep as, as as government, um, need to create good knowledge, knowledge that we can rely on, that's also open, uh, and we we can't leave uh, um, that to private, interested private corporations for, for obvious for obvious reasons. So we shouldn't we shouldn't start with the presumption that that the, the knowledge that universities create is there to create new industries or to uh, or create employment or whatever. It, it's it should be there to create new knowledge that that would um, that would allow us to uh, at least in part um, uh, 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 exert control over the, the 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 claims to knowledge produced produced by others. For example, yeah. So. So the public sector. So the public sector funding acts as a kind of countervailing force uh, to 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 private uh, 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 privately generated knowledge, for example, rather than being a subsidy to privately generated knowledge. Gotcha. The, yeah. the, that it's almost it, 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 both in terms of legitimacy, it, it's generating an, an alternative claim to legitimacy of ownership of knowledge, um, and it's also providing government with its own research centres. Uh, to help keep it independent as well as legitimate. Yes, exactly. Well, that, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. So, I so I, I think um, I, I don't want to mention the Haldane principle again, but uh, you know things like the Haldane principle, all that mythology is profoundly unhelpful when it comes to thinking uh, through what uh, what a what a better research policy the government uh, would would be. I feel like we easily have another half an hour of content here, but unfortunately we don't have that much time um, on the system. So I'm just gonna have to say thank you so much for coming on for the last hour. I've hugely enjoyed this. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's such a privilege to be able to, to talk to you questions from this range of directions. And I know I, from you, the, the Q&A is still exploding as more and more people sort of toss their own hats into the ring. So um, yeah, there's definitely a huge amount of interest. Um, I'm gonna hand over, I think, to James Price for now. So just. Thanks again from me, and I hope you had as much fun as I did. Thank you, Robert. I certainly did. Thank you. Professor Edgerton, yes, just to follow up from what Rob said, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for watching. Um, I'm sorry that cliches have taken such a battering, and uh, I now regret my decision to call this whole series Smashing the Silos, but thank you for helping us to do exactly that. And I hope that everybody here and more will be able to join us in an hour's time to talk to Professor David Krakauer, who is the president of the Santa Fe Institute. Until then, Professor Edgerton, thank you so much indeed again.